thankful to be back in town on this morning. I had a wonderful time uh, way up in the mountains, but I'm back and I'm happy about it. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in your precious Jesus, Son, Jesus' name, Lord God. We ask that you just continue to be with us as we go into this teaching on today. Father, I pray right now, Lord God, that everyone underneath the sound of my voice will be able to receive what it is that you are trying to say to them, Lord God. This is a word for us as individuals that we need to examine ourselves, Lord God. And so, Father, we know sometimes things that are good for us, we don't always like. But we know it's necessary, Lord God. Father, I know this is not an easy message for people to receive, but it is a necessary message for your people, Lord God. And so I'm praying, Lord God, that we will be able to take it, apply it, and then change, Lord God. Father, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated. We are continuing on our teaching that I started a couple of weeks ago. Amen. We started, um, I actually had two teachings thus far, and last week we celebrated our anniversary. So I'm definitely going to have to give you a recap in order for everyone to get on board. Amen. Um, always, we want to thank those that may be tuning in via live stream. It's always a pleasure that you uh, come and worship with us in this in this means. We know some of you all are not in the uh, Merlin area and you are unable to physically attend, uh, but we thank you for tuning in. We know some of you all may be physically sh uh, sick and shut in and have a desire to hear the word. We thank you for tuning in on today. And so, uh, God truly wants unity in the body of Christ, amen? He has expressed it in his word time and time again. However, we often have divisions and schisms because people get offended so easily, amen? We get offended over any and every little thing. And so Jesus said in Luke 17, 1, that it is impossible that no offense should come. In other words, there's no way that you're going to live on this earth and never be offended. But he said, woe to those that cause the offense, amen? It's something that we should not be comfortable with as far as being a stumbling block in the lives of others, and you'll understand that a little later. But when you think about it, he said, it is impossible that no offense should come. And so in reality, they will happen but what you do when you are offended is the key. Say the key. The key. Turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Bible, unless I uh, tell you that I'm coming from a different version. But right now, I want us to look at Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to simply look at verses 23 and 24. Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. And so when you think about it, as I said, offenses are going to take place, but what you do when you are offended is the key. When you are offended, you need to go to your brother or your sister to work on getting things right. The word of God says in verse 23, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and then remember that your brother has something against you, let me tell you something. Whenever somebody talks about an offense or when they, whenever they talk about you having an off with your brother or sister, trust me, somebody's name comes to your mind if you have an off in your heart. Somebody is going to come to your remembrance. And basically it's saying, when you remember it, deal with it. It says, Dad, remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Because when you're thinking about it, offering your gift before the Lord is a part of your worship. But if an offense is in your heart, it gets in the way of you being able to truly worship in spirit and truth. He is looking for those that will worship him in spirit and in truth. And sometimes you got to deal with the truth of yourself and say, I'm tripping with somebody and I need to get it together. Mm -hmm. And when you're able to do that, then all that stuff that's blocking your worship, all that stuff that's interrupting your relationship with God 
will begin to cease and you will be able to connect. And so I think about the word of God in Matthew 18. You don't have to turn there. But Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, in the message translation, it says, if a fellow believer hurts you, go and tell him. Work it out between the two of you. That's the word of God. It gives us instructions from when we have issues with one another. Say issues. issues. And so when you think about it, the offense happened. We're not denying that because stuff take place. We get offended. They happen. But when the offense happened, you know, you have a responsibility to go to that individual, talk about it, talk about the hurt, talk about what it is that may have bothered you. But in the midst of it, you got to get to the biggest part. And that is you got to forgive them. So you don't want to just have a conversation about a thing and you have no desire in your heart to really forgive them. Because forgiveness is the key. You have to forgive the one who has offended you. And so in the last teaching, I shared that people are easily offended. They are often, there are certain characteristics that are sometimes associated with people that are easily offended. First of all, I shared in the uh, last teachings that individuals that are easily offended are often selfish, they're often negative, they're often miserable, they're often unforgiving and insecure. We looked in the scriptures at King Saul, and we saw how his insecurities caused jealousy towards David, and how jealousy often consists of a combination of emotions such as anger, resentment, inadequacy, disgust, and helplessness. And so when you think about it, remember, as I said before, people are offended too easy. People are offended too often and for any and everything. Why do they get offended? We looked at some of those things on the last time we came together. We said that sometimes people get offended because they're not included in something or because they're forgotten. Now all of a sudden they're upset because you didn't include them or you forgot them. People get offended oftentimes because, you know, they come in contact with others with bad attitudes. Now a person with a bad attitude can offend you. But the reality of it is as the child of God, you got to guard your heart. See, just because they may be tripping and they may have a bad attitude, you can't allow that to cause you to get offended. Sometimes you got to recognize where a person is and leave it at that. Don't take it personal. It's but sometimes people get offended with people with bad attitudes. People get offended by people that are not like them. As I said before, you are one of a kind. Look at yourself. Touch yourself and say, I'm one of a kind. There's nobody else that is like you. Thank you, Jesus. And so when it comes down to it, people get, get offended that by people that are not like them, that by people that don't do things the way they think they should do it. Amen? And so when people do things differently, think differently than you, now you have a problem. People get offended when they can't get their way. Oh, my God, we have so many spiritual temper tantrums in the kingdom until it's unreal. And so when individuals can't get their way and can't do what they want to do, guess what? They have a tendency to get offended. People get offended when their opinion is rejected. First of all, it's your opinion. Hello? And everybody got an opinion. And everybody doesn't have to agree with your opinion. But when people don't agree with your opinion, they have a tendency sometimes to get offended. Because they didn't agree with your opinion. When you think about it, individuals have a tendency to get offended when they think you ignored them. Oh, he ain't speak to me. So now you tripping for about a month and the person don't even know why. They didn't even see you. They may have had something else going on in their mind. But because you think they ignored you on purpose, now you tripping. Say tripping. tripping. People get offended when they have to wait. Because people want to do what they want to do when they want to do it. Yes. Sometimes if you tell an individual to wait in a situation because the timing may not be right, guess what? They will get offended oftentimes and catch an attitude. People get offended by some of the simplest things. People get offended by the way other people dress. <laughs> can, can I just be honest? People really get offended by the way other people dress. 
First of all, if you dress too good, then that's a problem. If you don't dress good enough, that's a problem. And people get offended. I mean, it's amazing. Because we always checking people out and our minds take us places. And so, you know, just, just because somebody may have on an Armani suit, now you got all kinds of thoughts about them. Offending with them because of what? The way they dress because you are perceiving them to be a certain way when for real you don't know them? We get offended. And so in order to get the details about everything that we talked about in the past two teachers, I suggest that you get the CD if you missed it. Because I'm not going to go through everything. Amen? Amen? And so as I move forward, let me first define the word offend and offended again. The word offend means to cause displeasure, anger, resentment, or wounded feelings in. When we looked at Luke 17 on last week and we saw the word offend in the scripture, the Greek meaning for that word scandalon, because when you looked up the word in the Greek dictionary, the word offend, the word for it is scandalon. And we know that that's where we get that word scandal from, amen? And so when you think about it, you know, the word, the Greek meaning for that word is a trap stick or a snare. It means a stumbling block, which is an obstacle to, pro to progression or something that causes one to fall away from the faith. I'm going to say that again. The Greek meaning for the word uh, 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 thin is defined as a trap stick or snare, a stumbling block, which is an obstacle to progress or something that causes one to to fall away from the faith. Do y'all realize how many people stop going to church because they done got offended yeah. by something that is taking place in the church? Yeah. Some of them will quit and leave a church and go to another church, but then guess what? They find out that somebody at that church offend them there. Mm -hmm. So then they leave and go somewhere else. Guess what? You can't run from it. It's going to happen sooner or later. You just got to know how to deal with it. But you got a whole bunch of believers in the world today that don't want to have anything to do with church because they've been offended by the leader or they was offended by somebody else in the church. And the bottom line is church folks. Baby, you a church folk. Huh. Half the time we want to talk about church folk. What are you? Because at the end of the day, we talk about other believers. Are you not a believer? Are we not in a hospital full of sick people that have issues trying to get our lives together? So why are you going to trip if somebody ain't on the same level that you're on? When you are mature enough to know that, you shouldn't allow it to affect you. Amen. Let me tell you something. As a pastor, I have to guard my heart. Because there's so many different things that take place when you shepherd people on different levels. And if I don't guard my heart, I won't stand none of y'all. Hello? Hello? If I don't guard my heart. And if you don't guard your heart against me, you won't be able to stand me. Because I might do something to offend you. And it might not even be on purpose. It may be your own thoughts. But the reality of it is, it's a part of life. you got to guard your heart. you got to understand, we're dealing with flawed people. Ain't nobody in here perfect. Not one person is perfect in the body of Christ. And so... The word offended, it is defined as resentful or annoyed, typically as a result of a perceived insult. And as I said, a person's perception is what? Their reality. So they perceive a thing to be true when it's really not. Because sometimes, again, it's coming from your own thought. You get offended because of, of a perceived insult. When for real, if you take a step back, calm down, evaluate the whole situation, you will see that there was no insult that was ever given. There was no ill feelings in some situations that was ever done. And so it is the desire of Satan. We have to understand what we're working with and who we're dealing with. The devil doesn't want any believer to be victorious in any way, shape, form, or fashion. So guess what? Soon as you get saved, his mission is, I got to keep you from living this thing for real. 
I have to keep you from being a victorious Christian. So guess what? I'm going to throw all kinds of traps. I'm going to throw all kinds of snares. Remember, the word offend is a trap stick. It's a snare. I'm going to put all kinds of stuff out there. Because if I can get you to focus on that, you will miss the big picture. And so... We have to understand that it is the desire of Satan to keep you offended because he knows it will hinder your spiritual progress and growth. He knows that. Because if he can get you to stay stuck on the most, if he can get you to stay stuck on stupid, he happy. Because that's what he wants you to do. Stay stuck on stupid because you won't grow. So let me bring sister so-and-so into the house and have her to share a few words with sister so-and-so. Now, you got an individual that's all messed up because of what was said and taken out of context. Now that individual that was here to really grow or need to grow, now their growth is stunted because they stuck on something that they took the wrong way. And so you have to understand that Satan's mission is to steal, to kill, and destroy. So he will have you to get caught up and focus on some of the simplest stuff in church or with your brother or sister in Christ. Hmm. We can get caught up in the in, in stuff in the church that can offend us. Come on now, people can get offended by the music. Can I just be for real? Back in the day, you know, some people, you got some people that's old school with music. So the new school stuff, they can't get, get with. So I'll never forget, it was a well-known uh, uh, singer, and he told the story himself, I'm not telling anything new, but it was a well-known singer, Dietrich, Hat Dietrich Hatton, that went to a church, a large, prominent church here in the Maryland area, because I was at the event, and as he began to minister in song, the overseeing apostle of that church shut all the electricity, shut the power down. Wow. Hmm. Angered, offended by the music that was being sung. Even though the beat may have been different, the lyrics were still leading to God. But we get offended, angered, and bitter about some of the most simplest stuff. You would be surprised. Some of it is legitimate. And some of it isn't. And so the enemy wants to constantly keep us at odds with one another. So he will use any means necessary to get that done. Because God's plan is for unity, so Satan is opposite of God. So he's going to try to do whatever he has to do to break unity. And so he'll have you to get caught up and focus on some of the simplest stuff. Being offended can keep you from receiving from the man or woman of God that shepherds you. We're dealing with church, amen. We're dealing with the kingdom of God. God has set certain things up in the house, amen. And so when you think about it, being offended can keep you from receiving from the man or woman of God. Because guess what, for real, if I got issues with you, I can't receive from you. Right. I can't hear nothing that you're saying. You could be speaking truth all day long. But because there's a stumbling block, because I have an issue, because I'm offended, because I'm in my feelings, you may be speaking and preaching the truth, but I can't receive from you because I got issues in my heart towards you. And so when you think about it, offense will clog your ears and block your heart. Turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 6. When you think about it, you are offended with God's messenger, but it's going to cause you to miss out on what God desires for you to do or what he wants to do through you and for you. We don't understand the power of offense. We looked at Luke 17 last week, and we saw how serious Jesus was on the subject of offense. He does not take it lightly, and we need to stop taking it lightly. And so when you think about it, as I said, you're offended with God's messenger, but it's going to cause you to miss out on what God desires to do for you or through you. And guess what? There's nothing new underneath the sun. Not only do people get offended with God's shepherds and leaders that are in place, they got offended with Jesus. Yeah. Hello? Yeah. They got offended with Jesus. Let us look at Mark chapter 6, sign of verse 1. It says, Then he went out from there and came to his own country. 
and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? Now, mind you, for real, their minds are blown by what he's actually saying, what he's actually presenting. They, for real, bear witness to him and the power of God that's on him. But something else is going to get in the way. And so many hearing him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? They could not deny what was on Jesus. And so is this not, here come their own thinking now. See, because all of a sudden, when God illuminates a thing and it's a good thing, then you got to be where your own thoughts trying to get in the way. Oh, they realize he got great wisdom. They're astonished by the things that he do. They're astonished by the signs, the miracles, and the wonders, and how people are getting healed, delivered, and set free. But then all of a sudden, their own mind kicks in. And now they say, mm, is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Jose, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? <laughs> Key thing here. So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there. He was going through the land. He was doing great things. But when he came to this group of people, he could not even move and do the things that he would normally do. Why? Because of their mindset. Because their minds need to be renewed. Get past the vessel. Get past the messenger. Hear the message. But they saw the power of God. But then they got caught up. They, that, that ain't nobody but Tanya Mitchell. That ain't nobody but the pastor. That ain't nobody but elder so-and-so or minister so-and-so. Because we get to a point we want to begin to devalue a person and how God uses them. But the reality of it is, as long as you know your own value, can't nobody devalue you. No matter what their issue is. And so he had a desire to do great and mighty things in that place, but he couldn't. And so verse 5 says, now he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in the circuit teaching. He did a few things. A few people got blessed in that place, but most of them couldn't. Because it clearly said they were offended at him. They allowed his natural upbringing and the fact that they may have been familiar with him to be a stumbling block. So you're so great. You're giving all this wisdom. But guess what? You ain't no better than us. You ain't nothing but Murray's boy. But yet prior, they was astonished. They couldn't deny the wisdom and how he operated. And so it's hard to get through to offended people. If people are offended, it's like trying to get through a brick wall. You know how it is when a person has a made up mind, ain't nothing you can do to change it. Some things you got to say, God, you got to do this. You got to supernaturally touch this thing. Because guess what? Sometimes it's nothing that you can say that can touch a person that's offended. God got to break that thing down. And so the word, you know, clearly lets us know that it's hard to get through offended people. And we have to understand it's a trap of the enemy. Proverbs 18, 19, you don't have to go there, but it says a brother offended is harder to win than a strong city, and contentions are like the bars of a castle. It said it's, hard, it's easy to win a city than to get to a, a person that's offended, and so we have to understand that. And so bottom line, offenses need to be dealt with to silence the voice of the enemy. And to close the breaches that break unity. It has to be dealt with. And so oftentimes we don't address what has offended us because we don't like confrontation. Sometimes we just don't want to confront a situation because we don't know how it may go. 
We don't want any type of unnecessary friction. Well, there's too much friction going on in the spirit realm when you walk around offended and not dealing with it. So you might as well get over that and confront it and deal with it. And so as I said, oftentimes we don't address what has offended us because we don't like confrontation. But you must confront offense. What does it mean to confront? I'm glad you asked on this morning. To confront means either to face a situation that makes you uncomfortable or to say something to someone about something they done that bothers you. That's what it means to confront. And oftentimes we don't want to do that. It says to say something to someone about something that bothers you. But unfortunately, what we do is we say something to someone else other than the person that bothered us. When the word of God tells you, no, you go to that person. But no, we want to pick up the phone. We want to go here. We want to go there, have conversations with everybody else but the person. And you know what the devil is doing? Hey, ho, oh, he is happy. Oh, he happy. Because he said, that's right, my plan is working out. And so confrontation is a necessary part of life in order for conflicts to be resolved. People sometimes go through the same thing over and over and over again because of unresolved conflicts. And so in order for conflicts to be resolved, confrontation has to take place. you got to address it. You have to deal with it. And so remember, offenses can occur from a, for a number of reasons. Different opinions, amen? Personality clashes, miscommunication, jealousy, misplaced frustration. Because a person can be angry with someone else but take it out on you. And that can cause offenses to take place. And so when dealing with conflict, you have to understand that there is a way to actually handle it. First and foremost, when it comes down to conflict, don't try to suppress it. Don't try to suppress it. To suppress it means that you realize that there is a problem, but you decide to do nothing about it. You're fully aware that something ain't right, but you're going to just act like it don't exist. You're going to try to ignore it. You're going to try. You just ain't going to deal with it, but you, but you know it's there. So you're just suppressing it. So it means you realize that there is a problem, but you decide to do nothing about it. This isn't good in any situation, especially in marriage. Because guess what? Some individuals you deal with, you don't have to see them all the time like you see your spouse. So if you got some conflicts in your marriage, the last thing you need to do is suppress it and act like it really don't exist. Because that's not the way it should be. When you think about it, if you constantly suppress and you constantly realize that there is a problem, say in your marriage, and you decide to do nothing about it, Guess what? The person that's suppressing it, how they feel about their spouse can turn into a strong dislike or even hatred. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is, it's because you won't deal with it the way you need to deal with it. So it's just building and it's just building. And so you got to understand, these are the people that you deal with every day. See, if somebody in the church offend you, guess what? You can go home. You ain't going to see them again until you probably come back. But your spouse, they right there next to you. So you need to be able to deal with it. When it comes down to conflict, you know, you, when it comes down to conflict, you don't want to deny that conflict exists. Some individuals try to act like they is, like everything is all right, when for real it ain't. You, you don't want to deny that, exists, that it exists because it's there. Folks that deny that conflict exists try to pretend that they had no idea that anything was wrong when the relationship falls apart. I don't know why we broke up, and I don't know why we're not friends anymore. I don't know why, really. Just go back and hit the rewind button, and I'm sure you'll see some stuff. Stuff that you just ignored, 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 and tried to act like it didn't exist. No, for real, it was happening, but you was thinking that if you ignored it, it would just go away. And so, it was there, but you was in denial. It was there. And so when it comes down to confronting the situation, or the person that offended you, you must consider three things. First of all, you must consider whether to confront. 
And y'all probably say, but that sounds like an oxymoron because you're telling us to confront. But I'm going to clear it up for you. So three things that you must consider when it comes down to confronting a person or a situation that offends you, you must consider whether to confront, when to confront, and how to confront. Turn your Bibles to Psalm chapter 3. Psalm chapter 3. And I just want us to look at one verse, and that is going to be verse 4. Of course, it's a passage of scripture that we have looked at before, especially recently in our Bible study teaching when we are dealing in detail with anger. And so, whether to confront, first and foremost, oftentimes people that are offended are angry. It's a given fact. They're angry and they are upset about something. And so they're often angry. So first things first, amen? Psalm chapter 3, verse 4. The word of God says, be angry, okay? Because guess what? Stuff is going to happen to cause you to get upset. Psalms 4, verse 4. Excuse me. Psalm chapter 4, verse 4. I love the look on y'all faces that say, hey, hold up, what you talking about? <laughs> My Bible don't read like that. Psalm chapter 4, verse 4, and as I said, first things first. The word says, be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still, Selah. Before you confront anybody, Make sure that your attitude is in check. Make sure that your attitude is in check before you confront anybody. If you address a person with an angry spirit, it's not going to bring about the desired end that you're looking for. Because even though you may be speaking the truth, your spirit is repulsive. So get that in check first. Sit on your little bed and meditate before you move. And so the truth will be blocked because of your presentation if you come with an angry spirit. And as you meditate within your heart and be still, then you need to have a little talk with God. Turn to Psalm 139. After, after you take the opportunity to calm your little angry self down, sit on that bed and, and, and chill before you go and approach a situation, before you go to a person, before you confront anybody, first have a little talk with God. Psalm 139, again, a familiar passage of Scripture, verse 23 and 24. And the word of God says, search me, not the other individual, Hello. not the person I'm tripping with, Hello. but search me, oh God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. Ooh, and number 24 right here, and see if there is any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Because as you begin to search me, God, you may begin to reveal to me some things inside of me that just ain't right. And when you begin to do that, then God, I'm depending on you to lead me in the right direction. So that I don't allow this foul mess that's on the inside of me to continue to keep me on track. So sometimes if you are offended, you find yourself tripping. Take a pause for the cause. Right. Oh, yeah, you might be angry, but take a pause for the cause. Sit down, be calm, meditate, and then have a talk with Jesus. Hallelujah. And guess what? Many of us may not like what he reveals. Because he may reveal some stuff to you about yourself that you have been in denial about for a long time, but yet five people have already said the same thing about you mm. in different phases of your life. If they said it four years ago and they said it now, guess what? You ain't delivered. Oh, it's still going on. 
And so, it's important before you confront somebody, deal with the fact that you're angry. Because guess what? How many of y'all know being angry ain't a sin? Being angry is not a sin, but it's what your anger can cause you to do. See, your anger can cause you to refuse to forgive. Now you're sinning. Because the word tells you to forgive. See, your anger don't always cause you to knock somebody upside their head. Even though some of us want to do that sometimes. But the reality of it is being angry is not a sin. It is a true emotion. Because there are some things that truly get us upset. And so, have a little talk with God. And in the searching process, when you begin to say, search me, O God, a number of things could be revealed. Proverbs 19, verse 11, the NIV version, you don't have to turn there, but it says, a person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. Hmm. I'm going to say that again. A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. He were an offense. Not a whole bunch of offenses. An offense. In general, it may be a wise thing to overlook a one-time insignificant slight or annoyance that bounds to happen. For real. Stuff going to happen. And God will begin to show you, you know what? That ain't even worth addressing. If you open and you go into the presence of God and you ask him to search you and you tell him about this thing that's on you, but you're saying, search, search me, show me my ways, he may show you that that insignificant slight, that thing that just really annoyed you, is really not that important. Because when you live this life and you are dealing with so many people in so many walks of life, you are going to get offended in the course of a day, I guarantee you, probably about one person. And so bottom line, God may reveal to you that it's minor and that it's petty and leave it alone. Hello? Uh -oh. That's how you just break that down and lay it, sir. The scripture says a person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. In layman's terms, guess what? It's minor, it's petty, leave it alone. Don't even confront it. And so if you really think about it, if you addressed everything that offends you with every single person that you come in contact with, your whole day may be full of confrontations. The security guard on the door offended you before you even got upstairs to your job. You got to say, is it really worth it? Am I tripping? Am I already mad when I get to work, so now anything somebody else do to me is illuminated? He may be having a bad day. He may be angry and upset. And so because I know this person, they're not normally like this, why I'm going to trip and take it on personal today? Then you get on the elevator and somebody does something on the elevator that offends you and I angry. Mean, let's just say, I mean, life happens. They pass gas in the closed elevator. And it stink. Now, you got an attitude with them forever because, oh, my God, I can't believe they was that trifling and did that knowing all these people was in it. Well, guess what? How many of y'all know sometimes you tried to hold it in, but it came out anyway? It ain't on purpose. I mean, you know, sometimes stuff happens. But how many of y'all know a person may see that person again after that day and just look at them, grin on them, and don't even speak? Just think, you just nasty. I can't stand it. You just, really? But this is what we do. And so honestly, you got to look at some stuff and say, it really ain't worth me confronting. Some stuff is going to happen. So when you say, search me, oh God, he may show you that right there. Leave that alone. In the searching process, God may reveal to you that you, point to yourself, say me. me. He may reveal to you that you are the problem and not the person you offended with. Oh, say it, say it, say it. They did this, and they did this, and blah, blah, blah. When he said, uh-uh, pump your brakes. <laughs> you wanted me to search you, then let me show you yourself. And then he began to show you yourself. And guess what? A lot of times it's ugly. Yes. Real. It's ugly. Real. 
So he may show you, okay, yeah, my word says to confront, and if you got to offer your brother, get it straight. But baby, you ain't got nothing to get straight because they ain't do nothing. <laughs> you did it. It ain't them. <laughs> so deal with you. And so he may reveal that you have a plank in your eye that is interfering with your ability to see and discern correctly. He will show you, babe, I got this big old pole out my eye. I'm trying to deal with this little speck here. But I got this big old plank that's causing me not to be able to see what I really need to see. The devil has blinded my sight. And so when he show you that it's you, Prime example, when you don't need to confront it. You just got to be in tune to God then. Because again, everything ain't meant to confront. Calm your angry self down. Meditate on your bed. Be still. Get in the presence of God. Ask him to show you you. Don't pray your witchcraft prayers against the person. Because that's what we do. Say, show me me. And when he reveals to you, you, or what you should or shouldn't do, then guess what? Obey it. Then you have to deal with when to confront. That is very key. Of course, you don't want to confront anything until you got your emotions in control. As I said before, if you already upset, mm -mm, you don't go and confront anything. And so after you get your emotions to, under control, if God releases you to confront a situation, then go for it. When it comes down to confronting a situation, don't try to address a conflict in a busy atmosphere. You don't want to try to address it in a busy atmosphere because guess what? There will be too many distractions. Too much other things will be going on around you. And so the person won't have your undivided attention and vice versa. So be mindful of the place where you confront this situation. When you think about it, sometimes you need to set a time and a meeting place to be able to come together with that individual face to face. Let me tell you something. You got an issue with me, don't text me. Hello. You got an issue with me? Don't text me. I told y'all one joke to send me a text one time talking about I forgive you. The devil is a lie. First of all, I knew straight up I ain't did nothing in that situation. After months went by, almost a year, he came back and he admitted that. And I shared that with you all. He came back and admitted that he was wrong. He ignored everything that I said because he was offended. He was offended by the truth. But God had to show him that everything that I said was right. And he apologized. But he had an offense with me. And you going to send me a text and say, I forgive you? How many of y'all know I opened it up and did not respond? If you want to deal with anything on a serious nature, don't send a text message. Because guess what? Let's just say if I don't want to type and keep using the button to push the capital letter here to capitalize the words that should be capitalized at the beginning, and I decide, well, you know what? Let me just type it in all caps. Now, the other person on the other side think I'm hollering at them. <laughs> you accidentally, with these stupid smartphones, because they smartphones, but they're real stupid, right? You trying to hit a question mark and send an exclamation point, and you didn't hit send. Now they think you screaming. So it's no, don't use that. Pick up the phone and call. I mean, don't pick up, don't pick up the phone either, because this is how I feel about the phone. Sometimes you need to look a person in the eye. The eyes are the gateway to the soul, and it will show you what's really going on. See, because sometimes a person can say one thing on the phone, and you can't really get a real read. I mean, sometimes you can, you know, God flow like that sometimes, amen, but, you know, my husband couldn't understand that back in the day, you know, we on the telephone, how you know all this? I, baby, do you know the God that I serve? I ain't got the seed to be able to discern some stuff, but guess what? Everybody ain't there, so sometimes, you know, you want to just meet face to face, even I like to meet face to face, amen, I don't take for granted how God actually uses me, but, you know, face to face is good, so don't, don't really pick up the telephone and have a phone conversation. Say, can we get together, sit down and talk face to face? Because how many of y'all know you can look at their eyes, you can look at their body language, you can look at all kinds of stuff, and you'll be able to know at the end of that conversation, has it been resolved or if it's, it's still there? That's right. And so that's important when it comes down to confronting. 
When God releases you to confront a conflict, handle it ASAP. Say ASAP. ASAP. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, another familiar passage of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 26 and 27. And I'm going to be bringing this portion to a close real soon, so just give me a few more moments. Ephesians chapter 4, and we're starting at verse 26. And as I said, when God releases you to confront a conflict, handle it ASAP as soon as possible. Verse 26, the word of God says, be angry, here it is again. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. I love the message translation. It says, go ahead and be angry. It's all good. Go ahead and be angry. You do well to be angry. But don't use your anger to fit as fuel for revenge. And don't stay angry. Don't go to bed angry. Don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life. In a nutshell, when you read this passage of scripture, don't be immature with your understanding. Get to the point. Deal with it quickly. So the enemy does not have time to make matters worse. You have to understand because you oftentimes will have to schedule a meeting to confront a situation. You ain't going to be able to handle it the same night. You have to understand what the word of God is saying. Because some people be like, well, it's safe, you know, don't let the sun go down on my wrath, you know. You still got to take a time, you know, you still got to take a time to process Calm down, set up a meeting, and deal with it. It's not saying three weeks going to go by and I'm not ready to deal with it yet. No, you are stuck in a place of stubborn and need to get past it. But it's saying you don't want to let this thing just keep going by. Because you know what the devil does? He just uses it to add fuel to the fire. And the problem or the little minute issue gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so we have to learn how to deal with situations that come our way so that we won't have these breaches in our relationships with one another. We need to get delivered. And we need to really understand people. People have issues. We all just trying to get better and learn how to deal with our issues. Look at your neighbor. Say to your neighbor, neighbor, I'm human. Amen. And so are you. And so are you. We have issues that we need to work on. So if I offend you in the most simplest of ways, or in the worst kind of way, can you find it in your heart to forgive? Amen? Amen. We need to work on breaking down the bomb, the uh, of the breaches that separate us. Yeah. And so I'm going to end the teaching right there. I'm going to pick up on next week because on next week I want to deal in detail about how to confront the situation. I want to give you some effective strategies as to how to go about confronting the situations. Amen. Amen. I pray that you have been blessed so far by the teaching, amen, that we have been uh, having on the spirit of offense. Amen. That's right. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. Ain't that right, Deacon Mitchell? We want to give him a hand clap of praise. Amen. We thank all of those that took the opportunity to tune in with us. Amen. Uh, 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 feel free to come out and worship with us on any Sunday. Hallelujah. We at 7432 Old Alexander Ferry Road, Clinton, Maryland. It is our pleasure once again that you tuned in with us. Amen. Be blessed.